Praise the Lord, saints, and thank you for tuning in to hear a word from the Lord with Elder Mark Gilbert, pastor of Refuge Temple Church, located at 4456 Medgar Evers Boulevard in Jackson, Mississippi, where the mission is meeting people where they are, serving in the heart of the city of Jackson with the people of the city in our hearts. We invite you to join us for Sunday service, 1130 a.m. Central Standard Time, and Thursday Bible study at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. My name is Sister Toya Veals, and these are your announcements for the second Sunday, July 12, 2020. The Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith Incorporated is celebrating 101 years of bringing to the world the apostolic message of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are invited to the virtual Holy Convocation experience July 16th through the 19th, 2020. The theme this year is evangelism for such a time as this, reimagining our future through evangelism. The subtitle is Evangelism 911, a critical message for a critical time. Some of the speakers for the week will include Apostle Matthew Norwood, Bishop Henry Davenport, Bishop David Maxwell, and our own presiding apostle, Bishop James I. Clark Jr. Register today for morning prayer services, midday educational sessions, youth webinars, and uplifting evening worship services. Go to www.cooljc.org website or the Cool JC Facebook page. Cool JC Kingdom Kids are also included. Register your children at www.cooljc.org forward slash youth hyphen registration. Back at the temple, the missionary will hold its monthly fellowship conference called every second Tuesday at 7 o'clock p.m. Contact the missionary president, Mother Johnson, or Mother Harris for more information. The Ursha's ministry is celebrating two of their youth Ursha's who are celebrating birthdays in the month of July. Join me by sending a virtual happy ninth birthday to little Miss Kishana Luckett, who will celebrate a birthday on July 15th, and a little Miss Addison Claxton, who will turn five years old July 30th. We pray that you enjoy your day. If you would like to sow into this ministry, that we may continue to bring to you the Word of God in this fashion, do so through the Givelify app. Download the free app, search for Refuge Temple Church, and donate. You may also do so through Cash App. Download the Cash App and use dollar sign refuge 86 to give. Don't forget to like, share, and comment on the message to let Pastor Gilbert know that you're tuned in to the word. Please be sure to send out the hashtag, God is a refuge. This is what we believe during these difficult times. Include that on all your social media platforms. Now, let's get ready to hear the word of God with Elder Mark Gilbert. God bless you, everybody, and good morning. This is Pastor Gilbert speaking. Again, I say to each of you, God bless you, coming into your hearts and homes. It's always my pleasure to bring you yet another message straight from the Word of God. Before we get into the Word of God, there are a few things this morning that I want to share. First of all, the Refuge Temple Church family would like to extend a very happy birthday to Little Miss Faith Ola Beggy. Happy birthday, Faith. I wish you a very happy birthday. Refuge Temple wishes you a very happy birthday. And we hope you have many, many more. God bless you, Faith. If you're listening to this message, number two, go ahead and put this hashtag in the comments. That hashtag is God is a refuge. That's right. God is a refuge. Now, we started putting this hashtag out at the very beginning of this pandemic. And since it appears, by all accounts, that the pandemic is not slowing down, I want to reassure you that God is still a refuge in the midst of trouble. So I want you to put that hashtag on any and all of your social media platforms. In fact, put it in the comments right now, because we believe here at Refuge Temple that God is a refuge for us all, a very present help in time of trouble. So... As we preach this message, also feel free to let me know that you're here. Back in tune, continuing to comment and share during this teaching, this preaching, if you're blessed by it. So, 
go ahead this morning, get out your Bibles, your electronic devices, or whatever you use to take notes, and uh, get your cup of coffee out and dig deep into the Word of God. Today, we, we, we don't dig like we always do. So, let's go to work in the Word of God. Somebody type that in the comments. Let's go to work in the Word of God. Open your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 14 this morning. We'll begin reading at verse number 10, the book of Exodus, chapter 14. We'll begin reading at verse number 10. I've got my Bible. I hope you got yours. These words are recorded there. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. This is the New King James Version. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea, and I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. They shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Can somebody say, Amen. I would like to use for a subject this morning, for the subject, please share it in the comments. The subject is a question. The subject is, how did you get there? How did you get there? The setting of the Exodus, uh, chapter 14, is most likely familiar to just about all of you who are listening to me this morning. Even if you uh, were not consistent in your church attendance when we would come to the building, even if you didn't graduate from your local Sunday school department, uh, if you're from the old school, then you certainly have seen the Ten Commandments. If you're from the new school, you've certainly seen the Prince of Egypt. You already know what's going down in Exodus chapter 14. So as a reminder, the setting is that the children of Israel have been in bondage for 430 years. 430 years of slavery in Egypt. 430 years building pyramids without enough resources. 430 years without equal treatment. 430 years of overseers and whips. 430 years of slavery. And as if slavery was not enough, in Exodus chapter 1, we're introduced to a new pharaoh, a new king, a new ruler in Egypt who is afraid of the slaves. For he realizes that if the slaves become allies with the enemies of Egypt, that they would be overtaken. And so this new pharaoh with a demonic mind institutes genocide through infanticide. Meaning he sends out an edict declaring that all the Hebrew male children be killed. Because this Pharaoh has simply found out 
that if you want to eradicate the people from the earth, you attack and disregard their children. Stay with me. I, I, I won't be long. Here's how you attempt to erase a people from the earth. You red zone the districts and communities that they live in. Then you target those areas for gentrification and rebuilding properties that they can no longer afford to live in. You, you overpopulate their schools and underfund their education. And, and then you label them as educationally unfit by the time they get to the third grade. No, just know your history. You make sure that they're living in food deserts where there's no fresh, pro, uh, fresh produce, excuse me, and only processed foods for children to eat. And then you pass a farm bill that cuts the supplemental nutrition assistance program so that the kids uh, don't have adequate food. Then you over-police their communities. You're targeting their children uh, as suspicious. Then what you do is you monetize the incarceration and, 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 and put black and brown bodies in jail and then make it profitable for people to make money by sending these kids to jail. Know your statistics. Then you take children of immigrants who know nothing other than America and send them back across the border without any assistance or any family. And then you try to send them, back, uh, our children, back to school in the middle of a pandemic. That is how you kill a people. There's a new pharaoh in town who thinks all of this I just mentioned is a good idea. In the midst of this demonic administration that has come to Egypt. In the midst of this, we hear two words that ought to change your perspective and give you some hope. These two words are simply, but God. I, I wish I had someone listening to me who knows the power of those two words, but God. S someone say, but God. And the reason you say, but God, is because God has already orchestrated the deliverance of his people. God is going to liberate them from the hand of Pharaoh and in all sinners around a brother named Moses. I call him Moses. Moses is unique because Moses is bicultural. Moses is born Hebrew, but he's raised Egyptian. Moses has a heart for his people, but he speaks Pharaoh's language. Moses has access to the palace. And, and, he, and, and he came in, and he can come in and leave without being stopped. He has access to the White House. And just for a side note, don't allow anybody to tell you young people, that a Christian should not run for public office. That's not true. It's not the Bible. God needs people with the Holy Ghost to have access to the palace. Somebody he can use to bring real change. And I just got a feeling deep down in my spirit somewhere that somebody listening to me needs to run for office. Somebody type that in the comments. Somebody type the word run. Go ahead and run. Get you an exploratory committee. Uh, uh, don't be scared. Get you a campaign manager. Get your name on the ballot and run because God needs somebody with access to the palace to get things done. They got the Holy Ghost, but I digress. So God declares that if I'm going to deliver, I not only need some rebels outside, but I need someone who has access to Pharaoh on the inside. I need a man just like Moses. So God meets this Moses in chapter 3 of the book of Exodus. He appears through a burning bush and tells Brother Mo that I've seen the oppression of my people. And I've heard their cries. And, and, and you know the rest of the story. You know how it goes. Brother Mo is sent back to Pharaoh with one simple message. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, 
God told me to tell you to let my people go. Pharaoh is not moved by Moses. Pharaoh does not care about the message Moses brings. Pharaoh refuses to release the slaves. And so God, through Moses, enacts what the Bible describes as ten plagues in Egypt. That the purpose of the plagues was simply to assure Pharaoh and the Israelites that God was with Moses. Moses is used by God to initiate plague after plague after plague so that anyone who looked at Moses would know surely that the hand of God is on Moses. Nine plagues don't move Pharaoh. It's only the tenth plague when the death angel sweeps through Egypt. When, the, when, when, when Pharaoh, who wanted to kill Israelite children, now has the same death enacted on his family. That, that's when he decides to make a move. Because Pharaoh does not change until something happens to his children. Oh my God, Pharaoh doesn't mind deporting your children. Pharaoh doesn't mind uh, calling your children out of their names. Pharaoh doesn't mind sending your children, your sons and daughters to school in the middle of a pandemic and threatening to defund the school if they don't open. But as soon as something uh, happens to his children, as soon as somebody does something to his daughter or his son-in-law, he goes ballistic. Oh, yeah, they don't, don't get mad. It's, 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 right. it's, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I'm just preaching the Bible. So Pharaoh is moved by the 10th plague. And in chapter 12, he temporarily repeals slavery. He goes to Moses and the Hebrews and this is what he tells them uh, in, in, in the Mark Gilbert translation. This, this is what Pharaoh tells Moses. Pharaoh says, Mo, I don't care where y'all go, but y'all got to get up out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moses, I don't care what y'all do and where y'all go, but y'all got to get up out of Egypt. So the, the Bible says, watch this, 600,000 Israelite men, not including the women, and children all of Moses out of Egypt. As a matter of fact, what the Bible really says is that you have 600,000 men along with the women, the children, and a mixed multitude. I need you to understand, Bible scholar, that Hebrew and Israelite are not synonymous. They are not the same thing. The Israelites were part of the Hebrews. But the Hebrews also incorporated a mixed multitude. Don't you miss this? When God opens the doors of deliverance, it's not just the Israelites. Uh, he leads out. It's also a mixed multitude. Why? Because the hand of God does not simply favor one segment of society over the other. The hand of God operates to liberate all of those who are oppressed, all of those who are unjustly treated, all of those who are hungry, all of those who are discriminated against, all of those who are treated with implicit and explicit bias, God delivers all who are oppressed. That includes both race and gender, both education and income, because you cannot divide the hand of God when it comes to to liberation and freedom. Move on, Pastor. Gilbert. Move on, Pastor. So, 600,000 Israelite men, the women, the children, and the mixed multitude. That easily means, folks, that more than one million people follow Moses out of Egypt. Somebody say one million. One million people follow one man. Why? with one million people follow one man. Don't miss this, because this is important. They follow him because they believe Moses is following God. One million people believe that Brother Mo, Moses is listening to God, obeying God. We've seen the plagues. We know uh, he, he has convinced us that God is with him. 
One million people follow Moses because they believe Moses is following God. Please don't miss this. They looked at Moses and believed that God is with him. God is leading him. God's hand is on him. We follow him because God has got him. And everything is fine in the beginning of chapter 14. But ooh, we, by the time you get to verse number 10 of chapter 14, that's going to be a real problem. Somebody say, that's a problem. Because by the time you get to verse 10 or 14, two problems will come up. Number one, on their way out, following Brother Moses, they hear the sound of chariots. Somebody turns around and sees that Pharaoh and all his army, his choice chariots, the fastest ones he has, are pursuing them. Pharaoh has now changed his mind. He, he, he must have met with his economic uh, council, and they told him, hey, Pharaoh, we can't let this nation uh, be built without free labor. This nation has been built on free labor of slaves for a long time. Someone must have reminded Pharaoh that without slaves, there's no Egypt and Egyptian privilege. So we have got to reclaim these slaves so that we can make Egypt great again. Y'all going to get that Monday morning. <laughs> so, so they're chasing after Hebrews. One million people on foot being chased by an army and chariots. And somebody realizes, this ain't going to end well. But the bigger problem, Sister Gilbert, is not what's behind them. The bigger problem is what's in front of them. Because they follow Moses. They hear chariots. They look in front of them. And they've run up on the shore of the Red Sea. My God. See, you know how the story ends. So we tend to skip over the major details. But, but the details are, there's no bridge over troubled water here. There are no boats to cross over here. There, there, there's, there's no resources to get on the other side here. One million folks have followed Moses, and chariots are not far behind, and impossibility is in front of them, and they do just what some church folk know how to do. They complain. Listen to what they say to Moses. They say, Mo, didn't we tell you leave us alone in Egypt? But you had to bring us out here into the middle of the wilderness. Pharaoh is right behind us. We ain't got nowhere to go. Moses, you done messed up. Now, I want you to notice right here that there's no God talk in this scenario. They don't say, the Lord brought us up out of here. The, the, their realization of the Red Sea, not being able to cross it, has caused them to doubt whether Moses is really following God. Because if Moses was following God, this Red Sea would be open. I mean, if Moses got God right, this wouldn't be happening. We followed you in good faith, Moses, and, and you told us God was leading you. This is not how this is supposed to end. Now Pharaoh is behind us, trying to kill us. We ain't got nowhere to go. Moses, you are not following God. Now, I want you to put yourself in Moses' position just for a minute. Pharaoh behind, complaining church folks on each side, a closed red sea in front. The enemies in the back. Discouragers all around. And a closed red sea in front. Don't you miss it. They're all behind. Complainers around. And a closed red sea in front. Here is the dilemma that Moses faces, church. The dilemma that Moses faces is, how do I interpret the red sea? Is the red sea a closed door? Or... Is the Red Sea an obstacle we've got to get through? Uh, I've been following God. 
and I've come up on a circumstance that helps me realize that I don't know whether this is the Lord closing the door and telling me that I'm going in the wrong direction or is this the Lord giving me a sign that I have to learn how to stretch my faith and push through. Somebody, somebody type, which one is it? Somebody say, which one is it? Ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens when you walk with God. And y'all got to excuse me this morning, but, but I'm just the kind of pastor who's going to preach real life and real application because that's the point of listening to, to your pastor. If, if your pastor ain't preaching something you can apply, then, 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 then why are you preaching? Why are you listening? Somebody say, be real. You got to preach what's real. This is what happens when you walk with God. You run up against situations and you don't know how to discern whether or not this is God telling me I need to move in another direction or is God telling me to stretch my faith and push through this thing? Is the Red Sea a closed door or is it an obstacle for me to get, get through? My God, can I tell you what makes this difficult? What makes this question difficult is God uses both. Let me tell you about the God I serve. He's a closed door God. That when God sees you moving in direction that's not his will, when you're pursuing something that God doesn't uh, desire for you to have, God often wants to protect you from yourself. I, I like that. Somebody say, Lord, protect me from my own self. God is able to protect you by closing the door. And closing the door, you can't open. I wish you had a witness. God knows how to shut some stuff down. God knows how to tell you no. God knows how to make it impossible for you to go in that direction. Is there anybody listening to me on Facebook this morning that has ever experienced a closed door? Somebody say, yes, it's me. I, 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 I've had it happen to me. Because let me tell you about mature people. Mature people have experienced a closed door but can look back at it now and rather than getting mad, you can say hallelujah and thank you Jesus that God chose to close that door. Thank God she's gone. Thank God he's gone. Thank God I didn't get what I wanted. Thank God they unfriended me. Thank God they blocked me. Thank God I didn't marry that brother. Thank God I didn't marry that sister. Thank God I didn't get that job. Thank God he didn't let me move out of state. Thank God for closed doors. Somebody say, thank God for closed doors. Yeah. But God also uses obstacles. Yeah. Every journey of God is not Sunday. It's not hunky dory, happy go lucky. When you're faithful to God with intentionality, God will put obstacles in your path in order that you might learn how to get through and lean on God. God will put opposers and naysayers in your environment to teach you how to learn to ignore some folks. God will put some problems on your way to teach you how to get a prayer through. Sometimes uh, what you're facing is not a closed door, but it's an obstacle to tell you that it's not time to quit. Somebody say, ain't no quitting me. So how do I know the difference? How do I know what I'm facing? Is God telling me that I'm going in the wrong direction? Or God telling me to push through? How do I discern the difference? between a closed door and an obstacle. Uh, that rejection letter I got is that God telling me that I ought to stay at the job that I have or that I ought to apply, apply somewhere else. That, that disappointment that I'm dealing with 
Is that God trying to let me know that's not his will? Or is that God telling me to come up higher in my faith? That trouble in the relationship, I feel like preaching, that trouble in the relationship, is that God telling me they're not the one? Or is that God telling me to take them to the altar and leave them there until they change? What's going on here? How do I know the difference? Somebody say, that's a good question, Pastor Gilbert. It's a good question because people who were with Moses, the multitude, saw the Red Sea as a closed door. Telling him that this is not the direction God wanted him to take them. But Moses saw it as an opportunity to move in faith. How does Moses discern this as an obstacle while people see it as a closed door? How do you know the difference? Well, you're not going to like the answer because the answer is another question. And it's a question that only you can answer for yourself. The difference between an obstacle and a closed door is simply this. How did you get where you are? <laughs> Somebody say, how did you get there? Come on, child of God, lean in. How did you get there? The difference between an obstacle and a closed door is determined by your ability to be honest about how you got there. Woo! Here's what Moses understands that lets him know that this thing is an obstacle and not a closed door. Sister Gilbert, Moses knows this, that I just didn't get here by my own desire. That I did not get here at the Red Sea on my own. I just didn't magically show up one day and say, I'm Moses and I'm tired, let's leave and follow me out of Egypt. As a matter of fact, I was minding my own business when God showed up in the burning bush at Exodus chapter 3. And then I even had some reservations about going to Pharaoh in the first place. Moses said, listen, it was God who brought those plagues. And when we left Egypt, there was a pillar of cloud that was leading us. I don't, I didn't make that cloud. Now, you, you know, you all don't have the discernment to understand that there was a hand of God leading us out of Egypt. But I was following what I discerned to be the hand of God. I hope somebody is getting this. I didn't just get here and then start praying. I prayed my way here. Make sure you get this. I didn't just get here and then start talking to God. I've been talking to God all the way here. Look at Moses' prayer record. Somebody say, I've been talking to God all the way here. Come on, Bible reader. Let's look at the record. Let's look at how Moses has been praying. Let's walk this thing all the way down. Because by the time we get to chapter 14, Moses has been talking to God since chapter 3. Moses says in chapter 3, God spoke to me at Mount Horeb in a burning bush, and I heard him. And I kept on praying. In chapter 4, I obeyed God and went to Pharaoh even when I didn't want to go. And I listened to God, and I kept on praying. In chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, I went back to God, and I told God, you sent me to Pharaoh, and it didn't work out too well. He didn't listen to me. Nobody was delivered, but I kept on praying. In the beginning of chapter, I feel like preaching. In the beginning of chapter 6, God told me that you met your limit. Watch what I do to Pharaoh. Watch how I handle him. With a strong hand, he's going to let them go. And with a strong hand, he's going to drive the people of God out of the land of Egypt. God said to Moses, I am the Lord. I promised your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that I would bring you out of the land of Egypt and take you to the land of Canaan, that land flowing with milk and honey. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. 
Ah, but Moses kept on praying. And in chapter 7, uh, Moses said, I told God I needed an assistant pastor that I can trust. And he sent uh, Elder Miggins, I, I, mean, I mean Aaron, and I kept on praying. And God told me to go to Goshen so I could be protected from what was coming next. Oh, my, are you listening to me? In chapter 8, God told me to tell Pharaoh, I'm going to send frogs your way. I'm going to send plagues your way. I'm going to send lice your way. I'm going to send flies your way. And Pharaoh still hardened his heart. And I kept on praying. And in chapter 9, God said, I'm going to send a disease to affect all of his cattle. And all the cattle are going to die. And God sent boils. And then God sent hail. And then Pharaoh's heart was still hard. But I kept on praying. Ah, somebody said, I kept on praying. And in chapter number 10, God kept on moving. God sent locusts and then God sent gross darkness on the land. And, and, and Pharaoh told uh, Moses to get out of his face. Get out of my land. But I kept on praying. God said to Moses, I'm going to bring more, one more plague on this land. Every firstborn in the land of Egypt is going to die about midnight. But I kept on praying. And in chapter 12, God told me, Moses said, to tell the people to take a lamb without blemish, uh, a male lamb. And after 14 days, kill it and take the blood and put the blood on the two side posts and the upper door posts of your house. And then I want you to eat the lamb. I want you to eat all of it, leave nothing left. And whatever you leave, burn it. And when I come through with the death angel at midnight, the blood will be a token for you. And when I see the blood, I'm going to pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. And then Pharaoh let the people go. And the Lord told Moses in chapter 13, I want you to remember the Passover as a testimony that you have been praying to me the whole time. And I brought you out of the land of Egypt by my hand. And the plague did not touch you. It did not kill you because you were in Goshen. And the Lord went before us in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So by the time we get here to chapter 14, Moses knows I prayed my way here. Is there a way? Somebody said I prayed my way here. And the reason I know the Red Sea is an obstacle is because I got here through prayerful discernment. In order for you, church, to know whether you're dealing with an obstacle or a closed door is directly determined by how much prayer is behind you. Can you say you prayed your way to this dilemma? And I'll just come to tell you it gets quiet right about here because the truth of the matter is some of us, uh, some of the Red Seas that we're facing is because of our own desire. Every Red Sea you faced was not God. Somebody uh, somebody say, if you'll be honest, that was me. That wasn't God. So the people see a closed door. Why? Because they don't have the prayer life that Moses has. Moses has experiences from chapter 3 through 14 where he was talking to God. There was no congregation there. That's why Moses was able to listen to God and not the congregation at the Red Sea. Let me be clear. That situation you're dealing with, if there's been no prayer behind you, it's not an obstacle. It's a closed door. If you've not talked to God about it, that headache and that heartache is God saying no. That rejection letter is God saying, that's not my will. If there's no prayer, it's a closed door. If you're like Moses, however, and you've been talking to God from day one about it, if you struggle with God and surrendered to something you did not want to do, but you felt God calling, if you know that you've worn your jeans out from laying on your face and on your knees praying day in, day out, if you know that your oil has run out from anointing yourself every day. If you've prayed like that, then what you're facing is not a closed door. What you're facing is 
God giving you an obstacle, an opportunity to stretch your faith. If you know that prayer led you there, listen to what Moses said. Moses tells the children of Israel in chapter 14, I know you hear Pharaoh behind you. I know you see the Red Sea in front of you. I know you think I messed up, but let me give you some advice. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, that term stand still that Moses uses is the Hebrew word Yatsav. Yatsav does not simply mean stand still. Yatsav is not the Donnie McKirkland stand still. Yatsav does not mean just stand. It means to present yourself before God and let God work it out. Yatsav means give it to the Lord. Stand in front of God. Tell God what's going on. Fall on your face. Hand it over. Somebody say, hand it over to God. Let God work it out. And I promise you, you'll never pray to God and present yourself to God and yet solve and God do nothing. Children of Israel see Pharaoh behind them. I'm closing. They believe that the decision that Moses made is going to cost them their life. But when Moses was in prayer with God, God already told Moses before they left Egypt, I'm going to lead you out of Egypt. But don't trip. And don't flip. Because I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart and change his mind. And he's going to come after you. God has already told Moses, don't get nervous about Pharaoh. Because I'm going to harden his heart. So when the children of Israel heard Pharaoh coming. They thought Moses was wrong. But when Moses heard Pharaoh coming, he knew God was right. Let me say that again. Somebody type this. It'll bless you. When the children of Israel heard Pharaoh coming, they thought Moses was wrong, that he made a mistake. When Moses heard Pharaoh coming, he knew God was right. If you chose the wrong job, don't worry, because it won't last long no way. If if, 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 if if you get in the wrong relationship, don't worry, it won't lead to a happy ending anyway. Because you will see the salvation of the Lord. Sit back and watch God be God. And here's the shout. Here's the final word. And I'm closing right here. Nowhere in Moses' prayers from Exodus 3 to Exodus 14 did God ever mention to Moses anything about the Red Sea. God never told Moses he would face an obstacle called the Red Sea. Which means he also never told him that a way would be made in the sea. Which means God will make a way somehow. When you present yourself yatsav before God, stand still, God will make a way out of no way. Is it an obstacle or a closed door? The answer is you've got to determine how you got where you are. If God brought you where you are and you've been praying the whole time, it's an obstacle. But if you got there on your own, no doubt, it's a closed door. So the question is, as I close this, which one are you facing today? Only you can answer that question. How did you get here? How did you get to where you are? Did you scheme your way there? Did you manipulate your way there? Did you hand out cards to get there? Did you put your name out every time you, every chance you got to get there? Did you, did, did, you, did, did you do some favors on the side to get there? Did you disobey God to get there? If you did, you're dealing with a closed door. 
But if you prayed your way there, there you go. If you sought God, if you attempted to do the right thing as best you could, if you laid on your face, if you travailed before God, if you fasted before God, I'm here to tell you, what you're dealing with is an obstacle. How you got where you are is the determining factor as to whether it's the will of God or not. How you got there will determine if it's an obstacle or a closed door. Which one are you dealing with today? This sermon was born out of multiple questions I've been getting about this very question. Pastor, emails, phone calls, how do I know the will of God? How do I know this is an obstacle or a closed door? My answer to you, find out how you got there. And you'll discover which one it is. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. This is Pastor Gilbert speaking. Continue to tune in to Refuge Temple for the word of God. You have been a blessing to me. Thank you for all of your comments on the church page about the sermons. Thank you for tuning in for the Bible studies, the Sunday morning worship, your words of encouragement, your compliments, and your prayers for me and my family and the Refuge Temple Church. Thank you so much. Stay in touch with me. Keep watching and tuning in. And I will do my level best to keep bringing a relevant word of God that is applicable to your life today. Y'all pray for me as I pray for you. God bless you. Stay safe out there. This is Pastor Gilbert speaking. How did you get where you are? Shalom, shalom. God bless you, everybody. It is my prayer that the worship we just experienced together and the word you just received has encouraged a faith in you that's greater than any fear. As a matter of fact, if you're watching this broadcast and you're moved in your heart to surrender your life to the Lordship and the call of Jesus Christ for the very first time, or maybe, just maybe, you want to reconnect yourself in your walk with God in some way, do me a favor. Give me a call simply at this number right here at the bottom of your screen, as many of you have already done. And I will with joy and gladness share with you God's plan of salvation specifically tailored for your life in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ because there's no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. And as we get ready to say goodbye for the day, do me a favor. As Sister Veal said in the opening announcement, if you've been blessed by this word or any other word taught or preached through this ministry, please like and follow our Facebook page, as nearly 1,000 of you have already done. And I'm so proud of that because we just started our online ministry uh, at the start of the pandemic. So God is truly blessing, and I am appreciative of that. So follow the page and like the page that you might continue to be informed by what's happening here at Refuge Temple and the ministries that we have uh, available and upcoming for you. As always, as Sister Veal said earlier, you may give through multiple platforms, our Cash App and, of course, our Giblify. So I want to thank each of you for your continual giving, and I want to give a shout-out to those of you who are not members of Refuge Temple but have been giving through this ministry every week anyway. Thank you very much for your faithfulness in giving, the love that you're showing uh, to me, my family, and this ministry, your many comments, uh, your many likes, your many texts, your many words of encouragement. Thank you so much. It was not easy to transition from all we knew in South Carolina here to Mississippi, so thank you to those of you who have made this more easy for us and are beginning to make it home. So thank you very much. God bless you and to the almighty God who created of heaven and earth to the God who has brought us 
the Holy Spirit to dwell among us in earthen vessels to the Almighty, the Creator of the ends of the earth, who will always be with us, even to the end of the age, and who will see us through this pandemic. In his name, that's the name, Lord Jesus Christ, everybody said, Amen. And remember, how did you get here? God bless you. See you again soon.